about when a shepherd neglects his sheep, <coughs> it means hardship for the sheep. First of all, their security is gone. Uh, he's not there to keep them together. They, they scatter very quickly. They go their own way. And of course, by doing so, they put themselves in terrible danger. Um, they can be carried by dogs. They can, especially in Israel, they could be uh, eaten and killed and eaten by wild animals. Uh, they can uh, break their legs jumping off rocks. They can get uh, foot disease, mouth disease. They can get all their wool uh, knotted up with uh, uh, thorns and thistles. Uh, they can get themselves into an awful state. And if that shepherd then uh, is so selfish as not to care what has happened to the sheep, not to care that they weren't brought down from wa uh, for water down to the river uh, and had to find dirty pools from which to drink, which causes more problems, not caring uh, the, of the condition, the fact that they're sick or in need or, or whatever, uh, and then just takes every now and then, takes a, a sheep that they can get their hands on and slaughters it for themselves. You can imagine the situation is really, really bad for the sheep. Now, according to Ezekiel chapter 34, this is the sort of treatment that the shepherds of Israel had meted out to the flock of Israel. These were God's people, and yet these appointed shepherds more, acted more like hired hands who couldn't care less about the sheep and were only interested in feeding themselves instead of feeding the sheep. If there was any danger at all, they would be inclined to roam and save their own lives rather than save the lives of the sheep. So it's interesting that when Jesus comes along and he makes the claim for himself that he is uh, the good shepherd and uh, that the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep in John chapter 10 and in verse 11. John 10 verse 11. He says, I'm the good shepherd. Uh, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He presents an altogether different picture of himself and of God's uh, willingness to look after the flock now himself through Jesus Christ our Lord. He calls Jesus the Good Shepherd. That means that he is not only prepared to feed them and look after their needs, but he's prepared to lay down his life for the sheep. There is, a, there is an intimate and personal relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. And it's to the eternal security of the sheep that there is this personal uh, interaction and relationship between the good shepherd and the flock of God. And uh, we've got to see in it our security. We've got to see in it our hope. We've got to see in it our protection. We've got to see that uh, this sort of relationship with us is absolutely vital for us to, to make it, first of all, in this life, and then to be looked after for all eternity in the next life. It's desperately essential that we see this. Uh, we're told in uh, John chapter 10 now, verses uh, 3 through 5, about the good shepherd that uh, to him, that is the, the shepherd, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Here uh, is uh, sketched a very quick sketch of, uh, the, of, of Jesus coming now to call us. And uh, he's not calling us in the generic sense. He's calling us specifically. He knows your name. The shepherds had names for the sheep back then and they would call them by name and the sheep knew the name and responded to the name. But God calls you by name. Christ knows you by name and calls you by name. And you will hear his voice and he will lead you out into the pastures and to the rivers to drink, to the pastures to eat and to his protection and oversight and care which we all need every day of our lives. It says in verse 4, when he puts forth his own, he goes before them. 
and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Then Jesus not only <coughs> calls us by name, we know from uh, Matthew chapter 10 that, uh, that the very hairs in our head are numbered by, by the Lord. He knows us that intimately, that the very hairs of our head are numbered. He even knows us, brethren, better than we know ourselves. Let's look at uh, Psalm 139, beginning with verse 13. David says to the Lord, he says, For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all, um, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. So <clears throat> he has foreknown you before the foundation of the world. He has foreknown you. He knows who you are. He calls you by name. He is intimately acquainted with with all your faults and foibles. <clears throat> he loves you. He is going to look after your needs. He's going to lead you to the streams of water and of, of life. He is, he is the one who will protect you and care for you. He has taken responsibility for your life in eternity and in time. And he has shown us that he's prepared to lay down his life for us. What more can he do for us to show us how much he cares for us and how willing he is to take on the role of the Good Shepherd in relation to us and our needs so that we, the sheep, might have all of what we need in order to survive and to live and enjoy life uh, with him. He really does love us. Um, the, the scripture was read from Romans chapter 5 this morning. Let's have a look again at Romans chapter 5. He talks about, uh, for while we were helpless, verse 6, while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that, that should really strike a chord in us. That the shepherd is not just somebody who is, uh, who is out there in the sense of that he's detached from us. That uh, he's just doing a job. That uh, he cares but only to the extent that he's getting paid to care. Or that he's, that he's gaining profit from the sheep and, uh, and what they produce. This is a different relationship. And the relationship is different because of the love that exists between the shepherd and the sheep. And that love is there in regard to our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Just think again and again and again and again of how much he gave up in order to be <laughs> our shepherd, in order to show us our love and in order to save our lives from eternal damnation. Go to Philippians chapter 2 now, and we begin reading in verse 5. <coughs> Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Maybe that verse 5 will help us to, to see how difficult it is for someone to do this. Because he says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, 
but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. No wonder God highly exalted him. He, he left the glories of heaven. He left the peace of heaven. He left uh, the, the throne that he sat on in heaven and was worshipped by all of the angels in heaven. He left all of that in order to come down here and to be born as a man. He took on human flesh. He was in the likeness of sinful flesh. The great thing is, he never did sin like we have sinned. But he did take on that likeness of sinful flesh. He was one of us. He is one of us. He knows how to identify with us. It's not that he doesn't understand our struggles and our difficulties. He does understand our, our troubles and our difficulties. We can, when we talk to him, we can appeal to him knowing that he knows. Knowing that he's gone through the problems and faced situations that we have faced. He's gone through much worse than anything that we would ever face here in this earth. And he did it because he loved us. He did it in order to save us. Although he was rich, yet he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Think about the implications in that. The riches of all the heavenly existence and glory. He came down, he left it all behind in order to become poor. Born in a stable at Bethlehem. How much worse can it get for an infant to be born in a stable, not even in a hospital? It wasn't even a midwife around, as far as I know from the scriptures. But he was born in a stable and was laid in the trough. How about that for poverty? And we think we're hard up. We think we're hard done by in this life. That life has treated us rough and that we haven't got all the things that we need. He was brought up the eldest son of a carpenter. A very hard job that was. And very poorly paid. He lived in the backwoods of Nazareth. A nowhere place. <coughs> Infamous, infamous for being of no value at all. He was called a Nazarene for that reason. Why did he do all of this? Why would he then allow himself to be crucified as he was without reason? Because he had never sinned. He had never done anything wrong. The only reason, brethren, it was for you. You and me. And the reason he did it was because he knew without doing that, we would be lost. We would have no hope. Life would be one endless struggle that would just lead to an eternity of disappointment, disillusionment, pain and suffering. He did it to save you from all of that. <coughs> you think it's hell now? Well, if you ever do go to hell, and God forbid that you ever do, there's no need for you to go there if you don't want to. You just don't know what hell is. You're only getting a taste of what it, it might be like. So when we read Psalm 23, let's take some encouragement from it and some hope and know that we are the sheep and Christ is the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. 
and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <laughs> David's not a romantic. He knows life is the, valley of, is the valley of the shadow of death. He knows the difficulties involved in that. But he still has that hope of the goodness and mercy and loving kindness that would follow him all the days of his life. And he, he, he would realize and accept he will dwell in the house of the Lord as a result of this. Now, it's all very well me saying that that's how David felt to you. But is that how I feel? Do I get any comfort out of Psalm 23? Is it personal for me? Could I really say this to the Lord and really mean it? Can my heart be lifted up? Can I not feel that I've got something worthwhile here? I may have come into this place feeling lonely and empty and unfulfilled. But when I begin to think about what the Lord is promising me and what relationship he has with me, I've got no reason to feel this way. I'm only feeling this way because I'm letting life suck me into its de depression and difficulties. I'm not seeing beyond what I'm, what I'm seeing before my eyes or experiencing or feel. I've got to rise up above all of that. I've got to see Jesus is there. Jesus is looking after me. Jesus cares for me. Jesus will provide for me and protect me. Jesus will lead me to eternal life. I can't have anything more than I've got. And if you're not satisfied with those promises, well, I have nothing else to give you. Neither has God. Psalm 103, I think it's very appropriate in terms of the blessings that come our way as the sheep of God, or the people of God. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Is that not good, good, good news? Is that not a message worthwhile listening to and taking to heart? He does these things for us. See, he's, he's not blowing the trumpet. It's, it's like somebody who's doing things for you constantly. I suppose it's like the parents who's doing things for the children constantly. Always thinking of their well-being. Always looking after the needs. Seeing, seeing to them when they're sick. Showing love and kindness to them when they feel down. And yet so much of all of that is taken for granted. Never a thank you. Never even a thought to say, Hey look, I'm so blessed. I'm so loved. I've been so cared for. And I've never said thanks. And I've never recognized what has been happening to me. And I think that's the way God works with us through Jesus Christ our Lord. That it's all so subtle, all so, uh, so easy. That it's like it's just happening. And that there's nobody behind it. And that it's not the thoughtfulness of another person. It's just the way life is. But you're making a mistake. It's not just the way life is. It is because God is so good and thoughtful and kind and in his providence he's taking care of you and he's providing for you and helping you in every way. That's how personal this thing is. If we will just trust him, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all the things that we're worried about and troubled about, the clothes we're going to put on, the food we need on the table, the roof over our heads, our jobs, and all the rest of it, it'll all be added to you. Because he's able to do it for you. There can be no greater love than that a man gives his life 
for another. And Jesus has given his life for us. <clears throat> for you. You need to take heart out of that. I know there are always the doubters. And they say, oh yeah, Jesus gave his life for us. We're all going to die, aren't we? <coughs> yeah. I have to say, you're right. We are all going to die. But we're not all going to stay dead. That's the point. In John chapter 6 and in verse 40. <coughs> Jesus says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Look at John chapter 5 now, verse 21 and 23. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. Verse 23. Three, so that all will honour the Son, even as they honour the Father. He who does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. He says. Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. He, yes, will have to allow us to die physically because of the sin of Adam. Because that's the, that's the curse that has come upon the human race because of the sin of Adam and Eve. But he will raise us from the dead. All is not lost. The grave does not rob us of everything. We will be raised again. And that's by Jesus' promise. He has the power to do it. He's raised himself. And he will raise us so that we might have life abundant. the sheep. Who are the sheep? Now, Jesus was speaking to the children of Israel, the descendants of Abraham. And so far as everybody in Israel was concerned, just because they were fleshly descendants of Abraham, they were the sheep. They had the law of Moses, they had all of the they had the temple and all of the rituals. They were God's people separated from the rest of the world and dedicated to God. So far as they were concerned, they were the sheep. What they didn't realize was that the sheep in Israel were only those who belonged to the Lord. Were only those who belonged to the Lord. They were the ones who would hear the voice of God and obey it. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. <laughs> now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding you today for your good, he says. Now, of course, that command was given to the whole of Israel. Everybody in Israel, in every generation. And had they followed this teaching, they would have been God's people. In truth, God's people. In reality, God's people. But there weren't those in Israel who had a, not all in Israel had a heart to do this. And there were those in Israel who were wicked instead of righteous. Now Psalm 1 points out that there is always going to be a distinction between the wicked and the righteous. And because of that, not everybody who was in Israel was of Israel. In other words, not everybody was given to God in the heart. 
How blessed is the man, he says, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. But unfortunately, <coughs> there were those who were walking in the counsel of the wicked. As there are even today. Nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Too many in Israel have made the same mistake that we're making today. They think, I've been circumcised. I am a child of God. I've been born a descendant of Abraham. I am a child of God. Same thing as, I am baptized. I am a child of God. I'm a member of the Church of Christ. I am a child of God. It's all just words. Because people are living the way they want to live, not the way the Lord wants them to live. They have decided they're going to follow their own path. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. That's what's happened again. We've started to not concentrate on the voice of the shepherd. We started not to follow him, but to come at the back of the sheep and just wander off in little byways and highways ourselves in the hope that, oh, we'll catch up with the flock, we'll be all right, don't worry, I can handle my own life, I can see to myself, everything's going to be fine for me, don't worry about me. I am worried about you. I'm very worried about you. When you start that nonsense, you're back on the trail of what you were before you became a Christian. Somebody who's doing their own thing in their own way at their own time and has no mind for the Lord until they come on Sunday or maybe a turn up on Wednesday night. Wonderful. It can't be that way, brethren. Because, not because I'm saying it can't be that way, because the Lord will not see you as his. You do not belong to him if your heart is not given to him. If you're living for yourself, you are your own man. But you're not going to save yourself. Being your own man or being the independent one is not going to save anybody. It's going to lead us in the wrong paths. <coughs> We are the people of God. We are to serve God. So when Jesus speaks to the people and he talks about his sheep, these are people whom the Father has given him. <coughs> these are the people who have a heart to listen to the word of God in the law of Moses, had a heart to obey that word from the law of Moses, had a heart to pray to God and carry out his will in their lives. People like that belonged to God and God was pleased to give them to Jesus as his gift. Look at uh, John 17, verse 6. He says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. There's no sort of Calvinistic thing here. It's straightforward. Those in Israel who had a heart for God and heard God's word in the law of Moses were the ones who would recognize God's voice in the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
They would not only recognize God's voice, they would be willing to respond to God's vo voice in the teachings of Jesus. And so they would follow Jesus. Those who had not got a heart to live for God would not recognize the word of God. Even when it came out of the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ, they would not recognize it in the sense that they would not accept it and they would not make it or follow it so that it would be a part of their lives. So those who are really committed to the Father would hear the voice of Jesus. They would recognize that voice as the voice of God and they would follow Jesus. That's how they would show themselves to truly be the sheep. John, uh, let's look down at verse 8 while we're in John 17. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them, and they received them, and truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. That's how they became the sheep. But they always had a heart to serve God and to hear God's will. When the people, when Jesus asked his disciples, whom do the people say I am? Elijah, John the Baptist, or some of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? And Peter pipes up, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. God had revealed that to, to Peter through the, through the teachings of Jesus, through his sinless life, through the miracles that were, were being performed by Jesus Christ. God had revealed this to Peter. He could see. He understood. You are the Messiah, the Son of, the Son of God. When uh, Nathan came in contact with uh, Jesus, or sorry, Nathaniel uh, came in contact with Jesus, John chapter 1, 48 through 50. Let's look at his response to Jesus Christ. Nathaniel said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. <laughs> Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And so there were greater things than these. But, but Nathaniel was so impressed just by the presence of Jesus that he immediately trusted him. He recognized him as the King of Israel, as the Son of God. That's how the sheep show themselves to be the sheep. Even the Ethiopian eunuch, when Jesus was preached to him, responded to the word of Christ, to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he was baptized. So we hear the voice of God in the voice of Jesus Christ our Lord, and we follow Jesus. That's what we need to do in order to demonstrate that we are the sheep. Now, of course, there are other sheep. Uh, he talked about those other sheep in John chapter 10, verse 16. I have other sheep which are not of this fold, that is, not of this Jewish fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd, he says. The Messiah was to be a light to the Gentiles. Romans, uh, the book of Romans, uh, chapter 15. Beginning with verse 9, Paul says, And for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, Therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles. I will sing to your name. Again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. Again, Isaiah says, There shall come the root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles hope. 
So Messiah was to be a light to the Gentiles. Uh, and uh, the, the thing about this is uh, that these, these Gentiles then are also ones whom the Father has given to Jesus. Now, he hadn't been talking to the Gentiles, but he's talking about the Gentiles. And you wonder, well, uh, if it's not just a straightforward giving of the Gentiles, then how do the Gentiles fit in with what the, the Jews had to do in order to be the sheep? Well, the Gentiles fit in uh, in the same way as the Jews, uh, by responding in the same way. Because we're told in the parable of the soul that those uh, uh, people who were represented by the good soil, that they would hear the word of God and they would respond with a good and honest heart. Now that has to be, relatively speaking, of course, they're sinners, they're lost in their sin. But to some extent, they are open to hearing the word of God. They're spiritually minded to that extent. Not only that, but they have an affinity with goodness and honesty. There has to be some affinity with goodness and honesty in the heart of an individual before they will respond to the gospel. If that is not there, there is nothing to which the gospel can appeal. There has to be a good and honest heart there. And we have to be disposed, according to Acts chapter 13, disposed to the gospel. There must be some hankering in us for something better than what we have in this life. Some realization that I've been contaminated by sin and I deserve to be punished and therefore I need some, some way of getting out of this judgment and condemnation that will befall me because of what I've done and who I am. So when that's there, there is something for the gospel to appeal to in you. The devil has to find something in you in order to tempt you. Jesus says the devil's coming, but he, he will find nothing in me. Because there was nothing in him that the devil could appeal to. But he's got plenty in me that he can appeal to. And I believe you will say for yourself, he's got plenty in me too that he can appeal to. So he can trigger a response to those things that you desire in your heart and you want, and that's the way he works. But the gospel works in the same way. God triggers a response to your desire for goodness, through your honesty, through your willingness, or, or desire for something better than just what you're finding in this life. And so those people who were disposed in this way would hear the word and would obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now even though we all know we've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that we have been forgiven our sins, we are not making light of sin at all. And that has to be because of who Jesus is and who the Father is. If we have any recognition of who they are, we will not and cannot make light of sin or turn a blind eye to sin or make it of no account in our lives or in the lives of others. Let's be reminded of the fact that although Jesus is loving and kind and forgiving, he is also righteous. And in his righteousness, he hates sin. He hates wickedness. Now the truth of the matter is, we should have grown enough, and I feel very bad about this myself, for myself, we should have grown enough to have an actual hatred for sin. Not for the people who sin, but for sin, knowing it for what it really is, and how destructive it is. But I haven't even grown to that extent to where I have that real hatred for it. But Jesus has it. Let's look at uh, Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 
Verse 8. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. Listen to that. Righteousness is the measure of what goes on in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is righteous. And those who are in the kingdom are righteous. And anything less than righteousness is unacceptable in the kingdom of God. Jesus, is, Jesus rules in righteousness. You, he says in verse 9, have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness or wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Now in that he concurs with the Father 100%. There is no deviation either in the law of Moses or in the gospel of Christ from the standard that the Father has set. And every judgment on sin is righteous. <coughs> Revelation chapter 15. <clears throat> Verse 3. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all the nations will come and worship before you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. Moses and Christ praising God for his righteousness. The gospel or the law of Moses and the law of Christ concurring with the standard of righteous judgment which the Lord meets out to those who are sinners and rebellious, rebellious against his ways. Do we concur with it? <coughs> or are we always making excuses for ourselves and for all the other people who are doing the wrong and saying, ah, yeah, but you know, life is hard for them and they've got this weakness and... Uh, and I'm sure there are a hundred million and one ways to justify all the wrongs we do. I bet if we brought Hitler back and saw him before this congregation, he could give a good account of himself as to why he had to do what he had to do. And how the circumstances of his time would demand it. And how it would have worked out had God not intervened. He would have saw it all through and it would have worked out the way he wanted it to work out. There's not a sinner in the world who's done the most atrocious things. Who does not feel in some way justified because of his background or because of the circumstances that he's living in or because of what he is or what she is. That's the way we do it. That's what human is. Trying to justify the unjustifiable. Trying to make righteousness or into wickedness and wickedness into righteousness. Don't give yourself any rope or slack as far as that's concerned. You need to be hard on yourself. I'm not saying hard on others. You need to be compassionate towards others. But don't have that same softness in yourself because it doesn't work. It means you're giving yourself a license to do things you ought not to be doing. And if we concur with with our, if we are in agreement with Jesus and with the Father, we know it's wrong. And we know we'll face the judgment. And God is not going to show partiality in the judgment. If you've done wrong, you will suffer for that wrongdoing. Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian. We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And for what reason? so that we might be judged for what we've done in the body, according to what we have done, whether it's good or bad. I don't want to leave you dangling with that. I want to tell you that the sheep have passed out of death into life. John chapter 5, verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus says, he who hears my word, and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but has passed out of death into life. Romans chapter 8, another passage of great comfort for all of us. 
And this is the difference between the sheep and those who are not the sheep. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. That's not negating anything I said about how we should feel about wickedness. We are part of, we are God's people. We are, have, have to have the same frame of mind as the Lord does towards wickedness. We need to be hard on ourselves and compassionate towards others. We need to walk in righteousness and not give ourselves any license to do otherwise. No license, no justification. This is what we need to be doing. And we need to get about doing it. And we need to be hard on ourselves and say, <coughs> oh, no excuses, mister. Just get down there and do what you're supposed to be doing and stop playing around with this. This is too serious for us to be, to be playing around with. We need to be righteous. I hope I painted a picture that will be of, of help to you. I hope that you can see that if we are neglected by the shepherd and Israel had, had endured so much neglect and so much abuse from those who have been shepherds over them, that, uh, that God had spoken about it, as I said in Ezekiel 34. Read that chapter, it's really great and, uh, and it's very strong. And God had to promise that he would now leave those behind and he would himself intervene and shepherd the people. And of course he did that through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's why he, Jesus is the good shepherd. That this good shepherd has a very personal and intimate relationship with the sheep. He knows them by name. The very hairs on your head are numbered. He calls you. He leads you. You hear his voice. You follow him. You know it's the voice of God. He loves you. He's laid down his life for you. He will provide everything that you need in this life and in the next. He cares that deeply about all of your needs and all of your wants. You will not be lacking in any good thing that will serve to bring you to eternal life. There are those among the Jews whom the Father gave to Jesus as his gift who would be the sheep. And they heard the voice of Jesus, which was the voice of God, and they followed him. There are those among the Gentiles of the Lord, we're among them, who have heard the voice of Christ and have followed him. And we have become part of the flock, one under the great shepherd of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to realize that his standards and his ways, although they are righteous and the path is narrow and the way is rocky and difficult, that he will lead us through the valley of the shadow of death. And he will lead us on to the great expanse and pastures of the eternity. And the waters that are abundant for life. And every good thing and every joy and every blessing will be yours. Because the shepherd will see to it that you have them. <coughs>